Welcome to Lawyers with Attitude. Judy Ramjeet. Julian Young. Now, some of our viewers may know that we used to present a radio show called Lawyers with Attitude a few years ago. And uh, to keep up with Sign of the Times, it's now being transplanted to the World Wide Web. As long as it doesn't make us ill, you wouldn't want it to go viral, would you? Oh, Julian. I'm sorry about that. I have to apologise in advance for Julian's tendency to make corny jokes. Every week our format roughly will be talking about topics of law that have made the news headlines, having guests, hopefully controversial and stimulating guests, and also some of Julian's terrible jokes. But that's alright because I did stand up years ago at the other MCC. The Marlowe Comedy Club. Oh, I'm sorry. So, Julian, one of the week's hot topics in relation to what's making the legal headlines is the fact that a lot of old laws and the statute books are going to be repealed. Wise idea. I mean, apparently we can't eat mince pies on Christmas Day, you can't die in the House of Commons, and you can't enter the House of Commons wearing a suit of armour. Now, stop me if I'm wrong, but times have moved on since those were relevant laws. Not only that, but in the city of Chester, you can fire with a bow and arrow any Welshman outside the city walls, I think on a Sunday. And I rather suspect the Welsh and the people in Chester might like to see that law changed in the near future. Maybe we should ask the people of Chester about that, Julian. Anyway, in relation to the law regarding not eating mince pies on Christmas Day, do you know why that law was ever introduced? Oh, something to do with our Robert Cromwell, who didn't want anybody to celebrate anything anywhere at any time. And felt we all had to be very sombre, very boring, rather like lawyers normally are if they don't have attitude. And therefore they passed a piece of legislation, not dissimilar to the legislation that, for example, made it illegal to play nine-pin bowling because it was wasting so much time. People should be, I suspect, out uh, practicing archery for the defense of the realm. And so the uh, parliament decided that nine pin bowling would be made illegal. Of course, some bright spark, probably a lawyer, realized that it didn't ban 10 pin bowling. And if that had been banned, it would have been 11 pin bowling and so on indefinitely until the bowling alley was several hundred yards wide. <laughs> also, Julian, why was the law about um being illegal to die in the House of Commons introduced. Anyone who dies in the House of Commons by tradition many years ago had to have a state funeral. State funerals are expensive, always have been. And I don't think any government really wanted to spend money on someone who sadly and by fluke died in the House of Commons. And apparently people have collapsed and been taken ill and passed, passed away in the House of Commons. But I, I believe they are deemed to have died somewhere else. It's a, a legal fiction has been maintained but perhaps we can just change the law to make it a little less ridiculous. Well one person who definitely did not die in the House of Commons was the ex-MP Lembit OPEC and in fact Julie and I spoke to him earlier. This week's guest is Lembit OPEC now, uh, a lot of people have heard about some of Lembic's various um, forays into the world, but uh, not many people know of all of his extensive range of activities. A lot of people know that he used to be a Liberal Democrat MP. They may not know that he's an avid Leicester City fan. That's right, how do you know that? Curse um, of Lembic. <laughs> <laughs> they may not know he's also a pop band manager. <laughs> That he's an expert on meteorites, mm. an expert on Japanese motorcycles, mastermind, mm. celebrity mastermind contestant. We, I won't say how you did that. Is it all right? I've got 31 <laughs> points, all in all. Very Not good. Really Definitely. <laughs> and is there anything else you'd like the world to know about you, Lembit? I've just published a book called The Alternative View, which is an analysis of how the British coalition is doing in government. And I'm also co-running a new radio station, online radio station called uh, Glastonbury Global, which isn't a competitor to you. I think we view more as a partner. Oh, <laughs> thank you so much. <laughs> you're, the, you're the legal arm of uh, the media. <laughs> thank you. We do music and current affairs. Yes. So, Lembit, what's your take on the um, London mayoral elections? 
Well, I tried to be a candidate myself, but I was beaten quite roundly, mm-hmm. into fourth place in fact, so the party really didn't want me, the leadership were quite clear they didn't want me to be the candidate. Mm-hmm. I accept that, but I have to say exactly what I predicted would happen to the Lib Dem vote has happened. It's really bumping along at the bottom and uh, it's a two-horse race between Boris Johnson for the Conservatives and Ken Livingston, but it's not clear who's going to win. They've both got advantages and disadvantages and it's probably right down to the wire depending what the national political scene is at the moment. Mm. Now, um, why do you think that your party didn't want you to gain the Lib Dem nomination? I'm not an insider for the current uh, leadership. They're the Orange Book Group, which is a caucus which took control of the party, and they're right of centre, and I think much more authoritarian than myself, so my face didn't fit really. And I accept that, you can't be in fashion all the time. I think they're also concerned about my celebrity profile, which is highly ironic, Mm -hmm. because I've often said the one thing the Lib Dems really have to do is reach out beyond just being Liberal Democrats, especially in a very cosmopolitan electorate like London. But I made those points, I didn't win, so the pressure's now on Brian Paddock and the leadership to show that they made the right choice. Mm. And you mentioned your latest book, could you just give us some more details about that? Yes, the book's called The Alternative View, thanks for giving me the chance to plug it, <laughs> uh, available at £15.99 with a discount on, uh, on Amazon, so don't forget that. And also on Kindle, by the way, dear, dear viewer. Uh, the book really analyses whether the coalition is working, what's happening to the Conservatives and to the Lib Dems mm-hmm. and it's no more controversial than anything else I've written so I do call for Nick Clegg to resign as leader of the Liberal Democrats in it. <laughs> well, that's going to make you eternally popular isn't it? It will do the long term sir because it's not the conclusion we set out to prove at the start but once you see what the logic of the book is it's unarguable that Clegg cannot lead the Liberal Democrats to the next general election. If he does it's an act of selfishness not collective interest. Very, very briefly, can you explain why that is? The reason that Nick Clegg can't lead the party into the next general election, in my view, is that he he hasn't really delivered the kind of growth that he promised. Mm -hmm. He promised to double the number of Lib Dem MPs. So far, he's presided over the biggest numerical decline in Lib Dem MPs since the early 70s, Mm -hmm. the second worst decline since 1945. Secondly, the council base is really important to the Lib Dems, and we've actually gone back a quarter of a century Mm -hmm. in the number of councillors that we've got. Um, And then the third and the last thing is he's personally not very popular. Mm -hmm. He can be the Deputy Prime Minister, there's no problem with that, but he can't do both jobs. It's possible no one could, Mm -hmm. Uh, but I've said privately and now publicly, Nick, if you're really a collectivist, if you really care about this movement, Mm -hmm. then do what's not easy but right, to use his own phrase, Mm -hmm. split the roles, be Deputy Prime Minister and let the party rebuild. Mm, controversial view. Yeah. You still have to buy the book, even though I've told you that. <laughs> then you've had an interesting and long career in Parliament, some, what, 20 years it, or so? It was 13 years in Parliament, but 28 years in politics. So 28 years in politics. And you've obviously had the position of a legislator. Now we're getting on to the whole point of law. <laughs> that, of course, is very different if you're not a trained lawyer. How did you find having to discuss the philosophy of the laws you were uh, discussing, and also the actual laws themselves. What did, how did you approach that? As you say, I'm not a trained lawyer, and to that extent I've had to learn the process of legislation with the humility that has to go with it. The simple answer is that I was prepared for it to an extent because I learned my politics over all that time. As a student politician, it's a very simplified version of Parliament. As a councillor, it's an intermediate kind of politics. And then, as an MP, I learned it through the hard graft of debates in Parliament and the committee stages, which are really important as well. And then I studied philosophy, which really is the art of thinking. And I come from an academic background. And I worked in a a, a company which just didn't tolerate sloppy thinking. Add that together, and I I like to think I did a reasonable job. But the question you ask is very salient, because lots of people in politics haven't had that rigorous thought. And it shows in some of the very bad legislation that's made, when it's based on fashion or emotion, or what people, the the politicians think the people want, rather than what's right for the country. Interesting you should say that, because of course we're now looking at the question whether we should have, for example, trials in part in secret. In other words, a judge will hear some evidence, the parties involved, well, the government, if they're represented, will know what that evidence is. The other party may not know, and the public certainly won't know what's going on. Your take? I think we're heading towards a, a kind of a 
lazy insanity where the legislators are either being persuaded by some people in the law enforcement agencies or perhaps by the fashion of wanting to look tough to make it easier to get convictions. Let's not pretend this is about proving people innocent. It's about making it easier to prove people guilty. It's also in connection with civil proceedings. For example, someone suing the government because of rendition, yeah. because of yeah. an unpopular policy of some sort that's had an effect on them. Should a politician be responsible for what is confidential or a judge responsible? There's no way a politician should be making the kind of decisions which are in the politician's self-interest. This is about protectionism. It's about producing a kind of a shield to make it easier for politicians to do what they want without the inconvenience of justice. So a judge would have to make that judgment and there has to be transparency on that because if the judge can be bullied or cowed, and I've seen that kind of thing happen, then we're in a terrible position because with the best will in the world, eventually we'll have a cynical politician or a cynical government who says, now we've got the levers to protect ourselves. And I personally think we're heading that way, or we're already there. This just makes it worse. And the idea that uh, all our email, telephone calls, communications on the internet will be collective? Now, I'm a Lib Dem, and I thought that the coalition had Lib Dems in it. What libertarian thinks that it is in the collective interest to allow the government, in theory at least, to snoop on every single citizen in the United Kingdom in the interest of protecting ourselves, apart from the fact that it's logistically close to impossible, just think of the power you have over one individual if you wanted to prove them guilty, just by association. Sorry, in just in relation to your views, Liberal Democrat, in fact, Nick Clegg has announced that um, his party are going to um, publish in draft form their proposals how that can be scrutinised and limited and examined. What's your take on what he's trying to do? That's, do you think he's going to succeed? That's great news to hear that Nick Clegg has finally decided <laughs> to stand up against some legislation that I got an email mm -hmm. from another Lib Dem minister defending. Mm -hmm. Now I think that Clegg simply was responding to this, this groundswell of opposition from within the Liberal Democrat activist base mm -hmm. saying Clegg, what do you think you're doing backing this up? Mm -hmm. The problem is, mm -hmm. he's got form on this. Mm -hmm. The tuition fees when he did the U-turn. Mm -hmm. The health bill, which is pretty much what the, the Tories wanted anyway. Mm -hmm. So I'll believe it when I see it. Good words, but it's got to be uh, followed up in legislation. And I'm very, very concerned. You mentioned you studied philosophy. And I'll give you my philosophy that the, the idea of, being, of taking all the information about anybody and having it, collating it, is mm -hmm. totally wrong. Not because we, the, the argument is if you've got nothing to hide, it doesn't matter. It's the principle that our lives are private and that the government is not entitled to know. And of course, we've got the Dems, we've got Conservatives, we've got the Labour Party. What would happen if we ended up with a fascist party or a communist party? And we've seen in history what that has led to when collection of data becomes vitally important. Is that not the danger? There's a real danger that we'll have a hardline left-wing or right-wing party which gets elected on a particular issue or something that happens. So you're absolutely right about that. But there are two very serious issues, even if that didn't happen. The first one is, we all see the world through a filter. And sometimes somebody who objects to government policy becomes terribly inconvenient. For example, by camping outside Parliament and Parliament Square. We saw this ludicrous succession of legislation trying to get rid of one man. Now this can once again play completely into those hands. The second and perhaps even more serious thing that I've seen before is protectionism again. When ministers or departments feel threatened because something very embarrassing is about to be exposed. Now this is a perfect charter to silence that kind of opposition. Uh, I haven't got time to share all the examples but I, I'm sure that young recruits were murdered at an army barracks called Deep Cut. And all I saw was obfuscation and shutting down the investigations. Now this just makes that easier to shut up people like me who, who are a bit awkward to the establishment. And of course that can have an effect on the lawyers because the independence of, of the judicial function and the independence of the lawyers themselves is vitally important to the rule of law and a democracy. The picture of the we're painting in this conversation adds up to a really, really dangerous time for democracy. In terms of lawyer independence, I know of one case when uh, somebody got off a charge only because a lawyer, the same lawyer, had happened to be in a, another closed uh, uh, trial and said, hang on a sec, 
this is a contradiction to the other close trial where I just by accident happened to be privy to the secret information. Where does this stop? Already we're in a situation where uh, you have to buy your justice in this country and libel and various other things. This just makes it easier for the state to control people, the small person or the inconvenient person or the person who wants to demonstrate outside Downing Street about the war in, say, Iraq or Afghanistan and just gets arrested so that somebody else won't do it. Yes, and now in relation to um, libel laws, you've had a few problems of your own. And That's a level. euphemism. <laughs> <laughs> if you'd like to explain. One of the big problems I've personally experienced is in terms of libel. I had taken the rather, rather naive view that if you don't object to it too much, it'll go away. That was a big mistake. I was being libeled by somebody, a former partner in fact, who was in the press herself. Mm -hmm. And nothing was more attractive and convenient to the press than to have a go at the politician. I was making the mistake of also listening to the, the Dems' own press office, who were clear, clearly inexperienced in my sort of circumstances, who said, don't fight this in court, don't make a big issue. My advice to anyone is, if you can afford it, take it on and sue. I actually have never lost a case with the Press Complaints Commission. Mm -hmm. and. In my judgment, the libels has carried on in the same newspapers, demonstrably so. Uh, so the libel law works if you can afford it. Uh, Bernie Eccleston can afford it, and I couldn't. And I've, I've paid the price to some extent with my political career. Mm. But of course, being, just, able, oh, well, being able to afford it is the big problem, because of course now we're having we've had the, the, the new legal aid legislation, which is effectively taking legal aid away from people, and where it's going to be possibly Either if you can afford it and have a lawyer, if you can't, you have litigants in person. It, it seems to me that a bad situation is becoming even worse now. I had a good salary before, but I still couldn't afford to take on the Mail, for example, or the News of the World, who printed some of the most dreadful things about me and continued harassing me to an extent that I still have a, 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 a pain and, and, and agitation from what I, what I saw. I don't know, the News of the World libeling you, I'm not sure that's necessarily a a badge of pain or it's, shame at all at the moment, so it, 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 it's, usually it's, what we've been hearing. The, the truth is many people are li liable by news of the world, and I've been in uh, Scotland Yard and I'm sure that my phone was hacked. I was talking about my phone having been hacked years before it was fashionable to do so. In 2007 I was saying people are listening in on my phone, and it was impossible to get people to listen to it. Now we know why, it was a conspiracy. Um, the thing is, if I was rich then I could have done an awful lot more about it. For example, if the libel laws gave you the, um, the, the compensation of having the same amount written about you by law as was written against you in the first place, whether it's headlines, whether it's 14 pages, whether it's 40 pages, that would hurt. Secondly, sanctions against any journalist who has done this three times would have maybe barred from the profession for a while. And thirdly, make the journalist uh, potentially liable to have to pay it, uh, pay damages um, up to what they can afford the newspaper the rest. You've got to personalise it, because otherwise people hide behind a lack of responsibility behind the newspaper itself. Now that's one set of solutions. I have to say that at the moment I take a very gloomy view. I don't think the press feel that they've done something wrong. They just feel that they've been inconvenienced. Or they've been caught. Or they've been caught, that's right. They've been caught out. When you watch the uh, proceedings of the Leveson inquiry, and they're a timeless record of barefaced self-apologism, not apology, self-apologism. You don't get the sense that these people regard Leveson as much more than just, just an annoyance, an interference in their daily work. So in relation to the first point you made, having an equal amount um, you know, yeah. written about you in, in your favour, that's equivalent to what happens in the States, the right to, res to respond. Well, in the States it's, it's a so-called right to respond. It hardly exists as we shall discuss in another programme in the fairly near future. One which I'd like to see as well, because I've got the impression that the states look good on paper with their constitution and everything else, but in practice you've got some of the same problems. You have to buy your justice. They have um, the First Amendment right to publish almost whatever they like, short of saying there's a um, shouting out fire in a, lot, in a, in a locked theatre, the, the usual yeah. um, right, or rather usual restriction on, on a right. But you can only sue successfully in the States if you can prove malice on the part of the journalist. If they make a genuine mistake and they publish something, um, you're stuck. What I think they do need to have is what we thought we had, 
which we referred to a moment mm. or two ago, which is the right to get a response with as much publicity, same size headline, headline, to rectify that which they've done wrong. It's happened to me once as well, um, and I managed to secure that as part of the deal for not taking any further steps against the reporter concern. Well, in fact, it was the sub-editor concern. Do you think that is the answer? In other words, somebody writes something wrong about you, you turn around and say, that is wrong, I can prove it is wrong. I want you to write a report with the same size heading and a report explaining that, that what you wrote was wrong and the correct answer. The fact that you were able to get the equivalent size of uh, story putting things right is a testament to your ability as a professional in the legal uh, environment. There's no way I could have done that because I didn't have the, the authority, the, the power or the experience to do that. But and should you have that right? Um, I think that everyone should have the right for equal recompense in terms of column inches. But more than that, there's going to be an ongoing tale of, uh, of libel that goes with it. So the, the offending newspaper or, st or, or outlet has to also get rid of, has to scrub the internet. Now that's very expensive for a publication to do, but that's their problem. I still see the same libels which I've successfully taken to the Press Complaints Commission still up there in the internet. And you know what? The papers don't care. It, because I, I haven't been a big libel threat to them. My lawyer even wrote to the Sun on a number of occasions demanding uh, clarification. The Sun didn't even bother writing back to my lawyer. That's the level of contempt they have for the law in this country. Just as a counterweight, some people might say, well, sticks and stones, what do you say to that? Oh, well, so let's look at the argument that if you caught the press, then you've got the right to be libeled. Where does it say in any moral code that by being willing to um, cooperate with the press and you know, sometimes celebrate aspects of your life and do business transactions with the press at times, that means that they can actually li libel you and write untruths about you. I just don't buy that. Yeah. No, no, I, 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 to, to cl clarify, um, to an ordinary person that isn't whose life yeah. isn't reported in the paper, they might say, sticks and stones may break my bones. Oh, I see. Yes. Okay. Uh, if anyone thinks that libel doesn't make a difference, then look at the impact of my career. I think that I lost my seat in part, well, I think it was materially instrumental in me losing my seat as a member of parliament. Losing a career because of what was written about me, lies about written, written about me. But it's more than that. The press has broken up marriages. They've intruded, as we've seen, on private funerals for children. Uh, they've written stories which are completely unfounded about so many different people. On one occasion, uh, a journalist from an absolutely decrepit um, Sunday paper uh, sneaked into one of my ex-partner's children's parties, masquerading as a parent, and then tried to start making her answer questions. There's, there's, there's nothing in any human code of decency, nothing an ordinary citizen of this country uh, could be paid, I think, to behave like that, and yet the press do it. And when you challenge these journalists, when you meet them face to face, they're often cowards. And they always hide behind, oh, well, I just have to get the story and so forth. They don't have the courage of their lack of conviction. They just hide. Mm. Well, on another occasion, we will be speaking to an entertainment journalist for his take on this. Um, on a I'll, I'll probably pick it outside on that. <laughs> <laughs> but you have the right to do that because freedom includes the right to say no. Freedom includes the right to disagree with government policy, which is, I suppose, what makes us lawyers with attitude. <laughs> <laughs> Which is why you're such great lawyers. There's a plug for you. Thank Use you. these lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> now, unfortunately, we'll have to be bringing this to a close, but one final point I just want to um, point out is that you also have uh, an alternative career as a stand-up comedian. <laughs> and have you got a particularly good joke that we can end <coughs> this interview well, you, on? You, no comedian ever wants to answer a question <laughs> like that because most comedy is Putting observational. Put it yes. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, th I suppose my favourite joke, and it's not one I use on stage, would be when Mary Poppins orders egg on toast and cannelloni and when she's asked by the waiter what she thinks of the food, she goes, super cannelloni, but the eggs are quite atrocious. Yeah, it's but good I don't, don't use that. that. <laughs> don't use that. You have to practice that one. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. Thank you. It's a pleasure. And thanks for giving me the space to talk about my ideas. Mm. We'd like to thank Lembit Opic for coming in to tell us his often controversial and always stimulating views on various laws in this country. 
Now, talking to, looking at an international aspect, because we have viewers from all over the world, Julian, I understand that last year in America, fewer death sentences were imposed. I know you've got some very strongly held views about the death penalty. What do you think? Death penalty is inherently and morally wrong. Short of war, no, no state should ever take the life of an individual. It is the duty of the state to uphold life. And the Americans, I think, are slowly realising that they are out of step with virtually the whole of the westernised world. Let's ignore what happens in some of the Middle Eastern countries, what happens east of the, in, in the eastern part of Asia, where the death penalty is fairly common, and certainly a great deal more common than anywhere else. America should rise above that. America should, should take the European-based idea, which is you cannot and must not have a death penalty. And there are precedents becoming available through the United States Supreme Court, which I hope lawyers will pick up, which can guide their guide the American states to realise the death penalty cannot be imposed. Even for offences, terrible offences of murder, it is wrong for the state to take life. Well, if any of our American viewers, or in fact viewers from all over the world, want to send us emails or texts about their comments on the topics we've covered this week, please feel free to do so. Please feel free to email either Julian Young on julianyoung at jylaw.co.uk or Judy Ramjeet on judyramjeet at jylaw.co.uk We'd love to hear your comments and views about this program or about any other topics you might like us on Lawyers with Attitude to cover. Now unfortunately our program is coming to an end but we can't leave without Julian telling his joke of the week. Well the joke of the week is this, I turned down my friend's offer of a game of French Town Trop Top Trumps. I didn't want to lose. <sighs> so. I'm so sorry viewers. <laughs> but if you're willing to stay with us then we're looking forward to seeing you on next week's episode of Lawyers with Attitude. Attitude.